So our first speaker today is Edward Mulvey. Dr. Mulvey is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, and he's director of the Law and Psychiatry Program. Dr. Mulvey conducts research on adolescent development, juvenile offending, mental health and violence, and juvenile justice interventions. He has authored or co-authored more than 165 peer-reviewed articles, which is a lot. He's written numerous briefing reports and technical reports. Excuse me, numerous briefing documents and technical reports. And his research has been funded by the U.S. Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, National Institute of Mental Health, and National Institute of Justice. And he's conducted a number of studies, and I just wanted to mention one this morning. He co-led the landmark Pathways to Desistance study, which followed more than 1,300 serious adolescent offenders over a period of seven years as they transitioned into adulthood. This is the largest longitudinal study of serious adolescent offenders ever conducted. And the research team was looking for the various pathways out of involvement with the justice system and the characteristics of the youth who took those pathways. They also compared different sanctions and different interventions to determine how effective they are. And he'll sh share some of those findings today. In addition to his research, he's been a member and chair of the Science Advisory Board of the U.S. Office of Justice Programs, and he was a member of two National Academy of Sciences committees. So when I asked Dr. Mulvey how he got interested in this field of study, he said that he tried three different things before going to graduate school for his PhD in psychology. He first worked in an institution for juvenile offenders in Connecticut after college. He then worked with children who had developmental disabilities in a community-based program and in a group home. Then he took a slight detour where he returned to his hometown in western Pennsylvania to deliver pizza supplies to bars and restaurants. <laughs> so we're happy to say that he um, followed his heart with his first job working with the juvenile offenders, one out, the rest is history. Um, he did mention that he met his wife, Lori, who's a social worker um, at that first job, and they like to joke that they were institutionalized together. So today he will discuss research on adolescent development, behavioral health, and criminal offending. Why does it matter for juvenile justice policy? Good morning. Um, glad to be here in Madison. I, I like Madison a lot, the few times I've been here. And uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about some of these topics. Um, none of them are gonna involve delivering pizza supplies, so don't, don't worry about that. Okay, um, there are a couple things I wanna cover today in this amount of time that we have. One is this idea of adolescent development, what are we talking about, and how's it relevant at all to uh, juvenile justice? The other one is this notion of desistance, what do we know about uh, how adolescents stop offending? We, we know a lot about how people get into offending oftentimes, like risk factors. We know much less about when kids are already in the system, how do they get out? And how do many of the people we knew as young people turn out to be okay neighbors when they're older, okay? And the last thing is to just talk about some of the issues in an evidence-informed juvenile justice system, how you might apply some of these things. The first point I wanna make just is pretty simple, is that, is that we are in the middle of a sea change in, in the orientation of juvenile justice. People talk about different phases of juvenile justice broadly, and it's a locally controlled system, but there are broad phases that it goes through, and we're in the middle of one now. And this has to do largely with the fact that uh, recent developments in neuroscience and behavioral science, when I say neuroscience, I mean largely uh, taking pictures of people's brains while they're doing tasks and seeing what parts of the brains are related to others when they're confronted with certain situations. And the idea that, that combined with other more laboratory tasks, looking at adolescent decision making, has led to a conclusion that there really is an extended period of adolescence. There's, there's no bright line at this point of 18, 17, 16 where we say, aha, you know, everybody thinks differently. And that's been reflected in a, in a few things, and it, it, they're, they're fairly strong reflections. One is a series of Supreme Court decisions about uh, the death penalty or um, life without parole. And these have been pretty monumental decisions, basically saying that adolescents are different than children and adults, and that it's a, it, you, it, there should be some consideration of that. And that, that then has kind of rippled into policy and practice changes in a lot of states. They say, well, if adolescents really are different, should we be doing things differently? And we talk about the age boundaries and jurisdiction, as I know you've uh, been discussing in Wisconsin. Uh, 
And uh, it's also meant a reduced number of adolescents entering the front door of the juvenile justice system as, as more of them are diverted out uh, as they come to the system. A reduced use of institutional care and a promotion of interventions that, uh, that, that uh, promote developmental progress. And I'll mention that as, as we kind of go through, that we have responsibilities to these adolescents as we take them into their systems and out of their homes oftentimes, or have restrictions on their lifestyles. Therefore, what are we doing that's positive? How are we bringing them along? What, are we capitalizing on that, that touch we have into their lives? Okay. When we talk about this, this neuroscience and the uh, developmental uh, literature, this really comes down to a, a process that the, the neurobehaviors talk about as, as um, myelinization. It basically is that your brain doesn't really get bigger. You know, it's not, I mean, it gets bigger, but, but it, what really happens is that the pathways that you use a lot kind of get refined. They get myelinized. They get, they get set into place. And that's what the development and the growing of the brain really involves. And it happens at different times, and that's what I'm trying to show here, is each part of the brain is controlled, controlling, well, controlling, but involved with primarily particular types of, of functions. And the last one that gets myelinized and set into place is this frontal lobe. And it's under development, you know, they, they think they, they have evidence about up to age 24. Now what this means is that this part of the brain is what we call executive functioning. It's kind of like when you say stop and think, or when you ever raised an adolescent and you say, what were you thinking? Well, they, they weren't thinking terribly well because this, this isn't working terribly well. It's not real set in place, all right? So there's a lot of evidence regarding that that has accumulated over the last 20, 25 years or so. What this means also is there's also behavioral science, as I had mentioned before. And this, this is, uh, if you give tasks like uh, balancing benefits and costs or taking risks, what you find is, and this is a, a good uh, example of this, is that the impulse control, that, that solid line, develops kind of slowly and like you expect people to develop. While the other line, the sensation seeking, the idea of seeking out something exciting, thrilling, follows a different path. It peaks in adolescence and falls. The problem is, here's where the biggest gap is, all right? You've got somebody in, going through a, a, an expectable, transitory period in life where their impulse control is generally much lower than their sensation seeking, okay? So they're gonna do, better word, stupid things in the, in the course of this, okay? So uh, this, is, this is kind of a summary of a lot of behavioral literature that's out there. So you've got this neuroscience and you've got this behavioral literature. In the course of this literature coming out, the National Academy of Sciences asked for a review of it. So the National Academy of Sciences pulls experts together and they say, look at this topic and get back to us. It's an objective body. It's not, uh, it's not an agency of the federal government or anything. It, it, it contracts to look at particular questions. They looked at this developmental literature to say, well, what do we really have here? Do we have anything solid in this area? Now, their findings basically came from that if you look at the, bio, the, the neuropsychological stuff and you look at the behavioral stuff, they actually do line up so that the, the adolescents of certain uh, uh, impulse levels look different, the, the adolescents whose brains are developing more slowly perform differently on the tasks. So, so there, is a, there is a lineup of this literature. And they said there are three things that that, that, uh, that implies about the difference in development in adolescents and children. One is that adolescents lack mature, lack mature capacity for self-regulation in emotionally charged contexts. Now what that means is that you can talk to an adolescent and they can make a decision about a, a hypothetical task oftentimes the same way an adult would. But you get them in a situation where they're excited. What, what psychologists talk about is hot, hot cognitions. Something where all of a sudden your emotions are involved in this thing. If your emotions and, and you're excited at the time, adolescents perform appreciably worse than do adults in those situations. The second thing is there are heightened sensitivity to proximal influences like peer pressure and immediate incentives. So um, getting a short-term gain uh, matters a lot more in adolescent decision-making than it does in adult decision-making. And having three or four peers hanging around behind you also matters a lot more. There's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, literature on, on tasks, computerized tasks, and you can put adolescents in the room, they're not even their close friends and they'll take much more risks on the game, even though there's maybe nothing at stake at the time. So, so there's that, that's one example of a larger body of literature. The last thing is the inability of adolescents to make judgments and decisions 
that require future orientation. They certainly can do it, but they're not terribly good at it. So uh, if you want to say to somebody, well, that's going to affect how you're going to be 15 years from now, 15 years from now to an adolescent really doesn't, doesn't resonate a whole lot. There's not a lot, not reservoir of experience there to know what that means. And so, so those, those tasks are handled differently. And this is supported, as I mentioned, by this, this confluence of literature. That led the National Academy of Sciences to, to, to promote an idea that there, there are some, the goals for juvenile justice really, they, in, in this report, are promoting accountability. We talked about proper development of adolescents. What do adolescents do? In, you know, what's, what's the good stuff that gets you along a good path? Knowing that you're accountable for what you do. How do you do that? You've got to promote it through practice and tasks, okay? Ensuring fairness. There's also a good bit of, of literature that adolescents, and if you've ever talked to adolescents who feel they've been wronged all the time, the world isn't fair, okay? Fairness means a lot to an, to an adolescent logic and how they think about it. So the system has to, has to demonstrate fairness to them. And it's also preventing reoffending. It has to promote public safety. A juvenile justice system that just is nice and wonderful and trying to develop everybody isn't fulfilling its obligation to the community or to victims of, of, of crimes. So these are three tough things to do, but these are sort of positive developmental orientations to take. Now, um, as Heidi had mentioned, we had done a study on the pathways to desistance, and it's uh, 1,354 serious adolescents as they make the transition into adulthood. And the, the attempt was to do a lot of what I had mentioned before about, well, adolescents get into the system, how do they get out? How do they, how do they make that transition into early uh, adulthood? And there are a couple conclusions from that that I just want to cover. One is that the natural course for juvenile offenders is to commit less crime as time goes on, all right? And, and we have this based on a couple things. One is self-reported behavior. We asked them, what sorts of things have you done? And in regular interviews, we interviewed um, these adolescents, uh, you know, every uh, six months for seven years. So, uh, and then four, but it, we won't get into the design issues. But they, in, in the course of that, we would ask them 22 behaviors. Have you beaten up somebody so badly they had to go to the hospital? Have you dealt drugs worth more than $100? Have you done something, you know? And of those 22 behaviors, you have a simple score. How many of those 22 did you say yes to? It's just called a variety score, okay? And it's correlated with seriousness and a bunch of other stuff. Now remember, these are, these are adolescents who have all been convicted of a felony charge, okay? So these are kind of the deep end kids in the system. And you know that over time, if you look, they just start, they start to drop off. But you also know that not everybody follows the same path. They're going to report less antisocial behavior, but that doesn't mean everybody did less antisocial behavior. It means the group average did over time. So there's a way that you can separate out groups to say, is, is, are there distinguishable groups in here who follow different pathways? And if you look at our, our data on the, the self-report offending in that time, you find five different pathways. One are these high stable adolescents, about 10% of this group, okay? In other words, when we ask them those 22 things, just about all the time they endorse five of them, okay? Have you beaten somebody up so bad? Have you dealt drugs? Have you done this? These kids are, are, are doing serious crime. It's only 10% of the sample of this pool of felony offenders. The other group starts at the same point just about up there. You can barely see the yellow, but they start right up there at the top. They're twice the size of the, of the persister group, and we call them the desisters. 21% of them just drop off over time and report less crime. You've got another group as a late onset group, around, probably around age 18 or so in this sample, who start probably uh, getting, hitting dead ends in their life, dealing drugs, hanging out with violent, more violent people. Their stuff picks up at that point. That's about 12%. Then you've got these two low groups, mid-stable and lowest group, which constitute over half of the sample. And these, these adolescents just report very low offending. Now, now these, these groups are also corrected for time incarcerated because we knew how much time the kids had spent. So this isn't a result of these kids being locked up the whole time and not able to do anything. This is related to, these are corrected for the amount of time they were on the street, okay? So there are distinctions. The first thing here is there's variability among these kids. We start talking about charges and groups, you find variability in these samples. This isn't a fluke, this is kind of a statistical regularity, okay? So then you say, well, what's that variability related to? Well, if you look at what they came in on, the charges they came in on along the bottom, this was their presenting offense. Violent crime, property crime, weapons charge, drug charge, and other charge. The proportion of each of those trajectory groups is pretty much, uh, I mean, those, those trajectory groups are equally represented in each of those, those charges that came in. 
So if you say, well, he's here on a weapons charge, there's no doubt he's going to be a persister. Well, he's same likelihood of weapons charge as he is there on a property crime or a violent crime, okay? So, so those, that category of, of charge is unrelated to the rest of that movie, you know, and how it's going to play out, all right? So you say, okay, well, that's nice. Kids tell you what they do or what they don't do. They probably aren't telling you the truth anyway. So um, then you look at rearrests. And if you just look at rearrests, and I said we can account for the amount of time that people are on the street, if you take a rate of rearrests, so likelihood of committing a crime on the time you're on the street, that also falls off for this sample over time. I have another slide I haven't used that also shows the seriousness of the crime drops off over time. So that by the time they're out here around year six, year seven, most of these adolescents are committing what are close, just misdemeanors if they're getting picked up, okay? So I just want to mention that, 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 that first phrase, the natural course seems to be something's going to happen here that's going to move them down that system. Okay. The institutional stays in secure facilities do little, if anything, to reduce future criminal offending. We found this, other researchers have found this, uh, looking at uh, meta-analyses, large analyses of a whole hundreds and hundreds of studies of uh, recidivism effects of kids, what services produce what sorts of outcomes. The, it's, a, it's a weird question because we cannot, despite my best efforts, get judges to randomly assign adolescents to institutional treatment. You know, I mean, <laughs> we're having some trouble with that in the research world, all right? So, so if you then just take the two groups and you get probation and placement, so we get, we get we, adolescents on their first placement, if they, they came in, remember, th these adolescents came in on, on serious charges, so about half of them went to an institutional uh, placement, and half of them went on probation. If you then look at their rate of rearrest over the next two years after that time period, you find that the probation group had much lower rates of rearrest than the placement group. Here we go, we call this the naive comparison, and it's, it's a naive comparison because well, you, one of two things happened. Either the institutional placement was horrible and it made them worse criminals, or the judges are reasonably accurate at figuring out who's going to keep offending or not, and they're sending them to institutional placement and they're coming out, right? So you don't know from this. This is that selection effect of where we send kids. We have a way of controlling for that. We call it propensity score matching. I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but basically you look at what, what does a placement kid look like and we characterize them on 66 different variables. And you then take all the kids in the probation group and you say, how much do they look like a placement kid? And you give them a score from zero to one. And you dip into the probation pool of kids and you say, hey, here's a, here's a .7. Do we have a .7 in the placement group? And you say, yeah. So you put them together and you say, match, match pair. And you set them out. So, so you do that through the whole thing until you have basically two groups which are relatively randomly matched because they're, they're identical on their, their, uh, their background characteristics, at least on those variables. Okay, thanks. When you do that, that, that uh, probation and placement difference disappears. It's not statistically significant anymore. They're basically equivalent. The message is institutions don't seem to make kids terribly worse, but they don't make them terribly better either in terms of re-arrest, okay? And, and we just have, are thinking about re-arrest. We went on to another question about why, uh, it, it, how long an adolescent stays in a facility? Does that have an effect on rearrest? That same logic of the propensity groups we now do for thinking of, of institutional stays as a dosage. Okay, three to six months, six to nine months, nine to 12, so on. And you match across those kids. So the kids that are in the, the six to nine month are matched on a whole set of variables from the kids that are there nine to 12 months and so on across the way. When you look at their rearrest rates, you get this right here you basically get a statistically flat line. There's no reduction in re-arrest from having an adolescent stay longer in a facility. So this, this doesn't mean there's a magic number that everybody should come out of a facility in six months or something, but it does mean that in terms of re-arrest, you're not getting much of a policy payback uh, unless that adolescent is getting something positive going on in that setting. You, and this, again, is just re-arrest, so there are other things going on. Reviewing cases at a certain point makes a certain amount of sense. Okay, setting a hard line, again, not everybody follows the same path. Okay. A large proportion of serious adolescent offenders don't receive appropriate community-based services. Now, it was already mentioned um, about the, the rates of mental health disorders. These, these show a, a whole range of mental health disorders, and the, uh, the uh, prevalence rates, we, you know, the percentage of the sample who had a diagnosable uh, disorder. We, we do a, a diagnostic uh, interview with them. <laughs> 
these rates, I just point out a couple things. One is that African American kids tend to be lower in, in these problems, okay? Caucasian and Hispanic kids much higher, and the females on the right are much higher than the, the, the males on the left. Females in the uh, juvenile justice system have very high rates of mental health disorder, largely related to uh, early trauma experiences. So, um, so this is just a, a kind of a quick look over, over the differences. These rates, however, about five to six times what you would find in a high school sample if you just went in and sampled people. So the adolescents in the juvenile justice system have a high prevalence, right? But there's, again, some variability in these individuals. So then you look at, at substance use disorders and you see uh, basically the same thing. And, and uh, you know, again, African Americans lower and uh, Caucasians and Hispanics higher uh, for substance use disorders. Males and females about equivalent in, in their diagnostic uh, uh, prevalence. Okay. Then if you look at the work on mental health and offending, on criminal offending, you, you can, I, I would argue that you can kind of come away with a few things. One is they do have a higher rate of mental health and substance use problems compared to the general youth population. I just stated that. Yes, if you, if you go into facilities or you go into caseloads, you're going to find mental health problems and, and, and substance use problems. However, mental health problems rarely cause crime. They more interfere with rehabilitation. They're less of a risk factor than people talk about as a responsivity factor, how they're going to pick up on what you're trying to do. And mental health treatment alone is unlikely to have a strong effect on crime. If we just say, well, all we have to do is get these, these adolescents in, in the juvenile justice system, mental health, and everything will be all right. It, 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 this needs to be integrated with treatment for risk factors like substance use or other needs like job training, education completement, completion, other things like that will help them make a positive adjustment. Mental health alone is not going to solve the problem of mental health, uh, in, mentally, mental health problems in the adolescents and the juvenile justice system. This is partially because mental health problems, a lot of the adolescents with mental health problems also have higher risk, risk for reoffending problems. <laughs> So while they might have a family issue and they have a mental health issue, it's one of usually many things that's going on in their lives. One of the things that struck us in the data was we took the diagnosed group of, with substance use disorders and followed them for seven years. Remember now, we looked at, now these are adolescent felons <laughs> who have demonstrated problems, a diagnosable substance use disorder, that sample. If you follow, do they get services and where do they get services? Some of them get services in juvenile settings or in adult settings, but what's fascinating to us is in seven years' time, only 30% of that group ever received a community-based substance use service, all right? We know substance use goes with crime. We know these kids are already at the attention of the system, and only 30% of them over that time, they have a diagnosable disorder, only 30% of them ever get services. And if you map it out, how, how much of that time is spent in that service, it's about one in every 47 days uh, in the community is, is uh, t do they even touch treatment? So, good, thanks. So where do we go from here? What are we gonna do? Um, and, and I think this is a real challenge. We talked about evidence-based justice systems. Well, that's a great in, in yeah, it's great rhetoric. I mean, I, I like it a lot, because I'm a researcher, it keeps me in business. And so, what, what you really wanna do is you kinda wanna end up with a system that, that from the point of arrest there are decisions that have to be made about counseling, release, and diversion, probation, incarceration. And then they have to go to, adolescents have to be assigned to intervention programs. And then that's going to have different levels of recidivism connected with each of those programs. This is just sort of the natural flow. So what you want to do is have some risk assessment and risk-based dispositions in the front about what you're going to do with cases, some guidelines for cases. You're going to have to have some needs assessment because once you figure out how much of a risk they are, then you're going to have to have some needs assessment that says, well, th this one really should go to this highly integrated program, or for this person, X would be the smartest thing. And that all reply implies some sort of evidence-based disposition matrix. And you would hope that those programs' effectiveness somehow uh, works uh, to reduce that, that total reoffense rate, okay? and you're going to minimize reoffending. So at each of these decision points, we've got to have some structure to them, some guidelines, some parameters for reasonable practice. The essential problem for use of these tools, and I've, I've noticed that in some of the materials we look at, is a well-developed data system that tracks juvenile characteristics, services, and outcomes. None of this sort of logical, evidence-based stuff is possible unless we're collecting data on this stuff, because you can't hold 
providers accountable, you can't hold decision makers accountable until you actually have, well, here's what happened of all the, all the adolescents who came to your service or, or came before your court or are on your probation caseload or anything like that. People who have looked at the studies, I put this in here from Mark Lipsy. Um, they, in fact, the last study, I, I, the slide I stole from Mark Lipsy, and this one I'm stealing from Mark Lipsy too, I just want to be clear about that. Um, uh, Mark uh, does great work and uh, I, uh, we've worked together. Um, they looked at, at all of these programs and found that the discipline and deterrence programs, which he's calling control approaches and surveillance, you can see where those are largely just, you know, this isn't, isn't heavy treatment. And, and then he, he categorized, he's up to about 800 programs now that he's looked at and categorized. The therapeutic programs all produce a, 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 a reduction beyond chance in, the, uh, in, in recidivism and being rearrested. So, if you just kind of think of, you want to lean toward control or do you want to lead toward um, some sort of very challenging therapeutic interventions, you're likely to get a better effect with the therapeutic interventions. And the the, 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 if you're going to go that way, there's a couple things that have to be taken into account. One is a whether there's a stated therapeutic approach and it's, it's for internalized behavior change some sort of external control and deterrence. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying deterrence doesn't work. There, we, we have evidence that there is some deterrent effect. It's not as big as any of these therapeutic effects. But this is not an argument that you can never deter an adolescent. That, that, isn't, the, that isn't the case. But, but the, if you're just relying on surveillance, external control, deterrence, you're not going to get much bang for your buck. I can tell you that right now. And, and that you have to recognize it within a defined therapeutic category. And I, I'll, I'll just, I, I know I only have a few minutes, but I just want to say, we at one point tried to categorize uh, the types of programs that were being done in Philadelphia and in Phoenix where we conducted this study. We could not get reliable coding, meaning that two people would code something the same way from the state reports that you get about what the service is. There is so much jargon and gobbledygook and, and you know, uh, multifaceted, multimodal, uh, insight-oriented, uh, family-involved. I mean, everybody's got all these terms, and I, we couldn't figure out what any of these terms meant. So there's some method for thinking about how do you really think about what constitutes a therapeutic program, and that within those categories, some of those are going to be more effective than others. Cognitive behavioral therapy, mentoring, family therapy all have really good track records with reducing recidivism. They have evidence. And you have to deliver services in adequate amounts and quality. No matter what service you're giving, if an adolescent in the community shows up one week and there's the group leader, it shows up the next week, there's a group leader and one kid, shows up the next week, there's two other kids and no group leader, what are we doing here? You know, they're not getting a service. They have to get an adequate dosage, and some of them require more adequate dosages than others. And I'm meaning the services and to have some explicit treatment protocol and procedures for uh, monitoring adherence. The other thing to remember is effects are largest for high-risk offenders. The trick here is that if high-risk offenders get adequate levels of appropriate service, you will get a bigger recidivism reduction. You get a bigger reduction in crime and you get a, a, a better adjustment outcomes. Low-risk offenders uh, sent to highly intensive programs usually get worse. And, and we've got some evidence in our data to that effect as well. So this, this initial sorting and risk assessment isn't just kind of a bureaucratic fixture in some ways. It's actually really essential to making any of this stuff work. And in order to do that, I'd argue you have to track it and you've got to know what you're, what you're doing with, with adolescents. Okay? Thanks.